Imagine living your life after 50 and feeling energized and excited about your future. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast, the podcast for women who are ready to figure out what they want and create the life they deserve. Here's your host and master certified life coach, Susie Rosenstein. Hey there, welcome back to the podcast, Women in the Middle. I'm your host, Susie Rosenstein, and I am so glad to be here with you again for this week's episode, which is another interview in my series called Getting Real with Women in the Middle. The Getting Real interviews introduce you to amazing women who have done something scary or big, something that they would never have predicted that they would do or that their life would go in that direction. And now they're on the other side of it and they share their insights into what kind of thinking help them move forward and make the big change. Today's Getting Real interview is with someone whose empty nest experience was a little different in that she went from pretty full nest to empty nest in a blink. Carol has four kids, but three of them are triplets, so for her, the transition was a bit drastic. She's also someone who completely created a new and interesting career path for herself. I'm thrilled to welcome Carol Malko to the podcast. Enjoy the interview. Hi, Carol. Thanks so much for joining me here on the Women in the Middle podcast. Hi, Susie. I'm so excited to be here with you. Now, you know what's fun is whenever I interview somebody in Toronto, there's a good chance we're actually in the closet, and not on Zoom. So today's interview is brought to you from the Cedar Closet in Toronto. So only the most special guests get to come into the closet with me. <laughs> That's so awesome. I love being here. <laughs> it's surrounded by all the clothes from the 90s. Okay, so I am so excited to talk to Carol. Um, her life is very interested, interesting, I'm sure you'll agree. So let's start, Carol, with the 40s. What was going on for you when you were that age? When I was in my 40s, uh, my life was already on a whirlwind and had taken a different trajectory from what I ever thought I would be doing. I did have a career, a mild career in the computer technology industry, which stemmed back from my university days of taking computer science and math and getting a degree there. And um, something happened, though, that I wasn't expecting. And I went from one child who was about two years old to having three more triplets. They were about uh, two, just over two years apart. And I had to decide whether I was going to go back to that career. I was given a year to decide, which was wonderful. And I thought, if I go back, I'm just paying for two nannies to look after my kids. And I thought, you know what? I want to do this. I want to be the full-time mom. So that was back in 1997 when I gave up my career to be a full-time mom. Wow. And I bet you never looked back because I can't even imagine, I just can't even imagine how hectic those times were for you. They were a complete blur. My husband, <laughs> I, my husband and I say that the first two years felt like one long day. We were just very busy looking after the physical needs of our four young kids we had help and volunteers coming and going through our front door. It was a revolving door for a number of years. and I wouldn't change it for anything. I think it was the best decision I made. But it left me wanting more after they were in, in uh, grade school. And I thought, what, what, what now? What do I do? A full-time mom was great, but I still needed more. So I wonder, is that where the um, musical theater comes in? Ah, very nice segue <laughs> and very astute of you, Susie. Growing up, my parents gave us as much as they possibly could, and I was very lucky and grateful for that. They put us through dance school as well as through all of the uh, you know the public school system, and I, I took dance lessons ever since I was seven, and I didn't know, but that was actually a passion of mine that was there all along. And I continued to take dance lessons after I moved from New York to Toronto to go to university, but there was one year where I didn't. And I dreamt every night of dancing on stage. And I thought, well, I might as well make it real instead of just dream about it. Wow, how symbolic is that? Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> but that's what I thought. And I was about uh, 20 years old. So I started dancing again in, in uh, Toronto, and I haven't stopped since. And then um, I wanted to do more with that. So in my early 40s, I uh, there's an opportunity that came along to audition for a musical theater, amateur. And after the first audition, it was like I couldn't sleep that night. I was so excited to be doing it. And I did that for about seven, eight, nine years. I loved every minute of performing on stage. 
Wow, that's awesome. And one of the things that um, I didn't share yet is that Carol is my tap dancing teacher. <laughs> And one of the things that I did um, when I was 50 is I went away with my girlfriend, Karen. I never liked the concept of the bucket list. So I like to make an opportunity list. So my girlfriend and I, had we had a beautiful glass of wine and we were on a balcony in Florida at a resort and we were overlooking the water and boats coming in. And we came up with this beautiful opportunity list. And what do you know? Tap dancing was on my list. And so I happened to mention it. I happened to mention it to, uh, to a girlfriend. And she said, oh, my God, Carol is an adult. She's an adult tap class. I couldn't believe it. You know what? I, I love hearing that story. And that reminds me of um, how I even became a tap dance teacher because I took lessons all my life. I performed on stage and I let other people direct me. And um, one, one day, somebody had recommended me as a choreographer. And this was in the days of... He days of Heschel when our kids were there together. And they said, oh, Carol Malkel's a choreographer. And that got back to me. And I'm thinking, I am? And that <laughs> also was something that catapulted an idea until sometimes it just takes a suggestion from somebody else for something that was meant to be. So I gave it a shot and I actually realized I could choreograph. And in one of the musical pro theater productions I was in, in the second one, they, they quickly found out that I was a dancer. I had lots of dance training. That, and they said, well, can you tap dance? went, sure. Would you like to choreograph a tap dance break? I went, okay. <laughs> so it's like, I hesitant, okay, but I gave it a shot and it was, it was amazing. And I loved doing that. And I realized I love not just dancing, but teaching dance and choreographing. What a great combination. And it was so wonderful to learn that about myself. In the audience of one of the two productions, one of the two shows that night were Marnie and Rena Schwartz of Vibe Fitness and Dance Studio. They come up to me after the show and they said, oh, so you could tap dance. And they, and they knew that I choreographed the number because it was in the program. They said, well, we have a need for somebody to uh, just to cover our tap dance teacher at the studio. She's off on a leave for a while. Would you be able to do that for a couple of weeks, maybe a month while she's away? I went, sure. <laughs> so I was like, OK. It's like all these things I never thought I could do. I just, I just thought, you know, instead of saying no and walking away, I went, I said to myself, yes, I can do this. I'll figure out how afterwards, but say yes to the opportunity. So I love when opportunities present, present themselves, and then I just take them. And that sort of three-week, one-month stint turned into 15 years. I've been doing it ever since. Oh, my God. I love that story because, actually, I think that's how I met you, Carol. I think it was that our kids went to the same school until grade eight. And my kids were also involved in theater, in, either in the music or um, some of them were performing. And... um yeah, but I didn't put it together that you would actually be in my life later on because of this opportunity list and me actually tap dancing. And I was freaked. Like I saw it on my list and I remembered how much I loved it when I was 13 or 14. I think I only tapped for one or two years, a million years ago. And there it was on my list and I was so scared. And then my girlfriend said that she knew you, that you had that adult class. And I just took a big gulp and I was like, okay. I guess now I have to put my money where my mouth is. <laughs> and I just can't believe that we were brought back together again through that. And I love the way you just told your story, though, too, about saying yes and opening the door and walking through when these opportunities present. And even with all your dance training, you didn't consider yourself a teacher. You didn't consider yourself a choreographer. And then it turned into being something that uh, really gave you joy throughout an incredible incredibly intense and busy time in your life where I'm sure you didn't have much time to yourself at all. You hit the nail on the head with that one, Susie. It was a great joy to be able to do something and to give back, not just to myself, but to other people who also wanted to do this, whether it's for the first time or they've come back to it. And I also learned through the many wonderful students I've had over the years that whatever one learns in their dance training or anywhere in life, for that matter of fact, you can stop after five years, 10 years, 20, 30 years, like my sister has done, and literally pick it up where you left off and it all comes back. And then you get to enjoy it as an adult when you get to choose what it is that you want, what you want to do and how you want to spend your time. Taking lessons as a kid, you may not have that same insight. Um, but as an adult, when you get to make that choice, it's wonderful. And I love having new adults in my class. And it's been great, Susie, having you in my class. And I'd have to tell you, she's a pretty good tap dancer. You got to come out and see her. So, so to be continued. And it was wonderful when she reached out to me on Facebook and say, hey, I've got a couple of friends who want to take some tap lessons. I'm like, I, 
I made sure that I picked a night where they could all make it just so that we could I could do this for them. Wow. So it's so funny. I do think um, no, she was being very nice to me, but I do. I do. <laughs> no, think, <laughs> <it's true. laughs> I do think that um, I can see myself tapping going forward. I can see myself sticking to it. You know, and my I, I'm not competitive. I don't really care how much I don't need to perform and I don't need to be great. But it is amazing exercise. Like I am a little bit afraid of falling over, though, I have to say. Uh, it's very slippery in there. And having boys, I haven't been in a dance studio in decades. Like the whole experience was was pretty fun. Um, and not that boys can't tap, but in my experience, my guys were into swimming and gymnastics. We just, they weren't dancing at that point. And it's funny, they all ended up doing cheerleading at the university level. <laughs> so they ended I, I up- I saw that on Facebook. <laughs> they, they are pretty amazing, I must tell you. Oh, they're having a good time. So, okay. So the other thing um, that you didn't mention was that you also had a special needs kid so that you had a lot of obligations. I can't even imagine carving out any time when you've got that many kids and that many concerns and that many, you know, that much coordination going on at that point in your life. Yes, you're right, Susie. Having a special needs child on top of there being four little ones to look after really took the focus off of everyone else except that child to make sure that he would get the attention, the therapies, the medical uh, advice that we needed to help him through. And everything just took a lot longer because of him. But again, he's such an amazing kid. I, I wouldn't change it. And um, it just meant that, well, whatever I have in store for me is going to just have to wait because he and his siblings are more important. So that full-time job as a mom stayed that way for many years. But it didn't stop me from wondering and pondering down the road, like, what else could I do? What else could be for me? Yeah, I love that. And one of the things that um, surprised me a little bit about you, because I didn't know you that well back then, was that you got into real estate a bit too. Yeah, that's kind of a funny story. Not exactly what I was thinking when I was going to university to get my degree, um, but I, I married a wonderful man named Zan, and um, he was in the uh, real estate business. And you know, after we had our kids, he knew that I was searching for something to do that that uh, had more meaning and more purpose and maybe brought in a couple of dollars as well would be nice. And he was desperate for an assistant. And he just said, uh, why don't you just study for your real estate exam? So he'd ask me this like every couple of months. And I would say, no, no, not for me, not interested. That's your job. You do that well. It's not for me. And finally, one of those days, fast forward two and a half years after the triplets were born, he's, he asked the same question. I didn't say no. He goes, I'm signing up for phase one right now. <laughs> and that was probably, let's see, they're 20, almost 22 now. So that was, yeah, like 18, 19 years ago, I, I took the courses and I became a realtor to help him in the business and have enjoyed that and many aspects of it over the years. So when do you think that you actually um, started to feel like you were in a funk? You know, um, feeling funky like that is different for everybody. And I was just wondering when you noticed that that things were a bit off and you really needed to do some some thought work around what you wanted. It took a while for the focus to come back onto me. And it became a very loud voice in my head was like, you are capable of doing so much. You've got to find a way. And yet I didn't know what, in what area should that be in or could that be in? And I had, I really had a lot of choices, but then that made me stuck because I couldn't just pick one. That has been my dilemma for many, many years. Probably since you asked how long ago, I would say it was probably in my for, later 40s, mid to later 40s. It went on to my uh, early 50s. Um, I was bothered by the fact that I could not make a decision. So it wasn't a decision not to make a decision. It was a, I was just stuck. I couldn't choose between dancing or editing. Editing? Tell me more about that. I didn't even get there yet. Okay, thanks. I thought I would sneak that one in there. <laughs> um, I have been editing unofficially for so many years I can't remember. And in fact, uh, I learned to speak and write English very, very well not just in school, but actually from my father, who sadly passed away just over a year and a half ago. Uh, his English was perfect. He was very fluent. And whenever my sister and I would make a mistake speaking, he would be right there to correct us. And so inadvertently, we learned how to speak English correctly. That turned into knowledge I didn't know I could do something with. So I would have my husband, I would have my kids, I'd be 
editing their essays, their assignments. It's like, come on, can you take a look at this? Can, can you fix this? It's like, sure, sure, sure. On top of everything else, I'll just do your homework for you. <laughs> like any other mom who's got kids does their homework for them, uh, which I know is not, <laughs> not the best choice. But I also taught them. It wasn't just doing and giving it back. I wanted them to learn. So if I was going to put my time in, they were going to learn so that they don't have to re- you require anybody down the road and can do it on their own. So that was part of the deal. Um, and then I got to thinking, maybe there's more to this that I can do, not just unofficially for my family for no pay, but maybe I can do this into a business. And I thought about it and I thought about it and I said, well, what about the dancing? What about the this? And my family thought that I also could be good as a, as a psychologist, which was also running around in my head. And I thought, I don't know what to pick. And then the question one day was like, well, do I have to pick one? No, that's the answer that it took me finally realize that I don't have to pick just one. I said, I can do both well. I can do three things well. So I started telling my friends that I'm an editor. I actually stated, I am an editor. Now, do you remember when you had that idea to actually start to put yourself out there like that? Because I guess this insight kind of, I have this image of you like being in a funk and being chaotic and running around. And and then all of a sudden, you notice you have this idea that you have some natural gift and talent that was from your father, which is a beautiful story. But I kind of see it calling you. And I'm just wondering, what was it like to really say, you know what, I'm going to put it out there. Today is going to be different than yesterday, because I'm going to tell somebody I'm an editor. That's exactly what I was thinking. And in fact, I thought if I keep it to myself, who's going to know? I don't want this to be a secret. And I thought if it doesn't work, it won't work, but I've got to try. So I started to tell a couple of friends who I knew when I heard that they were writing a book or they had a book. It's like, I wanted to read the book and I wanted to ask about their editor. And if they're going to do another book, consider me for editing. And two of those friends, it was in the year of 2011. So I think it was in my later 40s, not to give too much of my age away, but... Um, <laughs> oh, we love it. We love talking about age in I here. <laughs> I know. It's, it's, an, it's just a stage, not an age That's thing. That's right. I, I totally get that. I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. So I, I voiced it. And that made a huge difference because when you put things out there to the universe, it does come back to you. Just make sure that they're positive things that you put out there. <laughs> um, and so two friends took me up on it and I have edited for them. And then word gets around and people make recommendations and referrals and... And I did get some work from that. I did get paid. And that's also huge. All right, now that I think about it, it was really an experience I had back in around 2006 or seven, where I was asked if I could do descriptive video service for a production manager who was given um, a project to work on the Bakugan series. And he was a, a native Hebrew speaker and English was not uh, great uh, he was not great at English, but was looking for somebody who was, and he could tell that my English was very good. So I said, do you think you could do DVS or descriptive video services uh, for me if I hired you? And I went, sure, but what is that? <laughs> so to explain, he explained it to me and I explained it to to everyone listening, is that um, it's for the vision in pair, just like there's the uh, closed captioning for the deaf, where you can read what's on the screen. Somebody who can't see but uh, a TV show or movie but can hear it needs to know what's going on between the dialogue. So this is where like an editor or writer comes in and fills in literally the missing blanks with what's going on. Like the telephone uh, is is ringing or someone is passing the water, the glass of water to somebody else. Oh, I had no idea. Uh, sorry. Um, so that and you have to be non-judgmental in what you write. So you're not giving away the plot or anything or foreshadowing anything. So you have to be very, very careful with what you write. And you only have sometimes a few seconds to fill in the information. It was challenging and I loved learning about it. And I would do that again in a heartbeat. So I did do it for the, the one full series with him while he was on the project. But that got me to thinking. While I was still thinking, uh, the same production manager also asked me if I could edit uh, animation scripts for TV, baby TV shows. And I went, that sounds like a lot of fun. And, and that for me came naturally. And I did that for a couple of years for him. And hence, that's where the idea of editing really was born that brought me to like, maybe I could do this, if not for a living, at least I can do this to add to my already growing uh, career choices and make something of it down the road. And that brought me to the 2011 point where I thought, I'm going to say it out loud. I'm going to tell my friends and have them tell their friends and just word of mouth and see See where that goes. Now, when you think about um, this trajectory of the insight and your passion for language and all of that, 
Um, how much of that was related to the space that you got once your kids flew the coop on mass? <laughs> okay, so 2014 was the first of two years where all four of the kids were out of the house, hence the empty nest. And when people told us, they told us, oh, you're empty nesters. And we said, yeah, I guess so. But, you know, when they come back and visit you every two or three weeks, it's it's not really <laughs> not so empty like people imagine. And because our four kids were only within a two-hour drive radius away from us, it was quite easy for them to hop on a bus and come back home. And uh, we relished that. We, we, we loved it so that we weren't really empty nesters in the true sense where they were just, they left home and left home for good. I don't know when that will be. <laughs> uh, and I'm not rushing it. And I do enjoy, I do enjoy them when they're back home. And right now they're all back home this summer. And I've, they are now 24 and almost the triplets are almost 22 years old. But it gave me time, a lot of time to think. I didn't, I had a lot of time to think because I wasn't busy cooking dinners for six people. I wasn't yeah. busy doing laundry for six people. I wasn't busy driving around five pe five people, including myself. So it, the thoughts were sneaking in louder than I could. I could push them away and it bothered me enough that it's like, I can't ignore them. It, it wouldn't be fair to myself to ignore them anyway. And it, I was thinking about this for a number of years. It wasn't an easy question to answer. What do I do now? Yeah, I love that. It's very common. A lot of my clients talk about that. Either they typically don't have a clue what they want to do or they're too afraid to, to kind of listen to a thought that keeps popping in. Um, so I totally understand the overwhelm and confusion that comes from identifying a few areas that you're interested in. And actually, that happened to me, too, when I was thinking about um, the focus for this podcast and the direction of my coaching. I was thinking, well, I've got all this experience in addiction and mental health, and I have all this experience in health promotion, and I had some tragedy and trauma early in my childhood that I could um, speak to. And I knew that there were so many ways that I could be of service and I, and I could actually help people. But the thing I couldn't get out of my head, I was just so fascinated with the years for me that were between 45 and 50, where I had a job that looked amazing on paper, but I was so unhappy. I was so stuck and I couldn't figure out why I was so stuck when every other time in my life, if I had a problem, I could just figure it out. If I had if I knew I needed to do something, I could just get the job done. I had direction and clarity. And for whatever reason, menopause, uh, pending empty nest, aging, 50 coming on, I was just in such a different headspace. I could not believe it. I didn't understand it. And I just whined to my friends all the time about how confused I was. What should I do? What should I do? So I was just, I personally have been always really fascinated by human behavior, and I was fascinated with myself. So interesting that this phase of my life, for whatever reason, I couldn't figure it out. And that really, that experience, that personal experience really helped me focus on women in the middle and what it's like to see 50 coming, uh, have the kids getting ready to leave, even though sometimes it takes 10 years. It's a transition <laughs> that we, that we love and hate. And, um, and we adjust too, because, you know, it really is an adjustment. Um, but it did take some time for me to really, really see that. So getting back to your story, your story, now that you've uh, got the voice, you've actually uttered the words, you're still dancing, and you've put it out there that you're an editor. Um, what advice would you give to other women in the middle who are stuck? and confused and just have this feeling that there's more that they could be doing, what can you um, suggest that they think about as they have all that spinning around in their mind? A great question. And I wished I was asked that many, many, many years ago. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and I love your story, Susie, by the way. And so you've turned adversity into something so powerful and so wonderful for, oh, for women. You. And I am actually, actually am honored to be sitting next to you and just have you back in my life. I think that's great. And really, we, we really are do. really sitting next to each other. We really we are. are. like touching. Our <laughs> arms touching. are touching in the closet. In the cedar closet. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and I thought I wouldn't miss this experience for the world. I think it's if you can do it, do it in the closet. <laughs> I said, you know, you can just do it. <laughs> that's the new slogan. <laughs> if you can do it, just do it in, in the, the closet. closet. Yeah, for sure. Okay. No, I said, Carol, you can. We don't live that far apart. But I said, you could just, you know, in the comfort of your own home, we can do the interview on Zoom. And she's like, no, no, I want to see that closet. 
<laughs> and and the the chemistry and the rapport that the two people have uh it it feeds off one another and it, and you end up just having a, a much better time and and perhaps interview from from that so um here we are so yeah so what would what advice now i'm not letting you get away okay. with, from the advice <laughs> okay be patient is the first thing and believe in yourself is the second and then listen to your thoughts don't push them away um they'll come back and if you're not careful they'll come back in a physical way and it will it will you'll be fighting your physical symptoms because you're not dealing with the emotional or the mental things that are 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 plaguing you and following you around so you really do need to be honest with yourself and say if you're not happy with what you're doing ask yourself why and then say what options do you have and no matter how silly or foolish or like oh it's not going to make any money or it's going to be a waste of time or what are people going to think and what am I what's this one going to think it doesn't matter it only matters what you think and how it makes you feel so true and one of the things i talk to my clients about all the time is the difference between the what and the how so the question of what you want to do is completely different from how you're going to do it but when we start to focus and spin and get all into our head and start freaking out, we're really thinking about the how <laughs> most of the time. And once you figure out the what and feel really excited about the what, then it's much easier to think about the how and to look at things that might get in the way as obstacles. And then you just come up with strategies to overcome the obstacles. It's much easier to separate things out. I love the other thing that you said about being patient. Um, I mean, really, if you make a decision to stay at home with your kids, being present and really putting yourself into the experience, just like all experiences, is so important to do. You weren't saying, I wish I could do this. I wish I could dance again. I wish I could, um, I wish I could help my husband. I wish I could uh, focus on editing. You were just kind of responding in a very curious and open way when things came your way. And it's funny, the interview that um, I did recently with another Carol, Carol Rosenstein, um, she started a nonprofit called Music Men's Minds, and she started a nonprofit. She's in her 70s. And this is what she said, too, is that you just have to dream big. You can't not open doors. Being open to opening a door of opportunity can really change your life. But if you're too fearful and too closed minded to even see what's on the other side of the door, you're going to definitely miss opportunities and you may not end up on the path where you can really contribute. What do you think about that? I think you're an amazing life coach. Excellent <laughs> advice. Thank you. You're so sweet. So Carol, how can people find you if they have some editing that needs to be done? Thank you so much for asking. And um, I just recently this year have uh, put out my new editing website, which uh, my son Jeremy um, has put together for me, um, and it's uh, www.carolmulcoediting.com. So it's my name, C-A-R-O-L-M-O-L-K-O, editing.com. And um, I'm very proud to say that I have finally done that because it's one thing to just say you're an editor, but people want something. Uh, they want to see accomplishments, experience. They want to know something more about you. And I thought it's long overdue. And I'm now working on my business card because people will ask me, can I have your business card? And all I have is my real estate one. And I'm going to take a page from Susie's book. And she's got a card for all the different things that she does. And she yep. separates her expertise. So if she, somebody's asking about life coach, she hands in the, her amazing life coach card. And she, they want to ask about her beautiful artwork. Oh, thank you. And, and her jewelry. She hands them that card. And it's like, I learned something important from you, Susie, and I've never told you, Ooh. but I'm going to tell you now, and I'm sharing it, I'm sharing it uh, to everyone as well. And um, I was struggling for many years. I was like, people with the question, what do you do for a living? I hated that question. I didn't have a good answer for many years. After I resigned from my, my computer and technology work, it's like, I don't have an answer for that. Full-time mom is great, but that kind of outgrew itself by the time the kids were in, you know, grade school and high school. So I avoid I would avoid asking anyone that question because I didn't want to be asked it myself. And here comes along Susie who does at least two if not three things really really well and she's an expert and a professional in in them all. And I took I, I took that to heart. That meant a lot to me, that there are people out there who can be very good at more than one thing, and that's okay. So now when people ask me, what do you do for a living? 
well, I don't know that if it's for a living, but what do I do? I tell them I wear many hats and here are some of them and and I enjoy them all. And it's like, I'm okay with that. I really am okay with that. Oh my God, I love that. You should have seen Carol's face when we were at, I was tapping. And I said, Carol, you know, I have this podcast. She's yes. like, what's a podcast? <laughs> right in the middle of tap class. <laughs> and I said, you know what? I think your story is compelling and I would love to interview you. And she honestly had never even heard of it. She was uh, very shy about sharing her story. And I'm like, you know what? No, you really do have an important story to share. So, Carol, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I'm going to put your contact information in the show notes. And if you are local to Toronto and want to take jazz or tap from Carol, that information will also be in the show notes. So thank you very much. It's been my absolute pleasure, Susie, and I look forward to doing many more amazing things with you down the road. Thank you. That's it for this episode. So many of my clients think seriously about being an entrepreneur of some sort, but let fear get in the way. Making choices and putting yourself out there can be so overwhelming. But Carol reminds us all that sometimes you don't have to make the choices you think are necessary. You can come up with something that's creative and unique just for you. I was so excited to introduce you to someone who finally allowed herself to focus on herself so she could craft this new and interesting career path of her own. It is totally possible to find yourself in midlife. Who knew, right? If you like what you've heard, just head over to the Women in the Middle podcast on iTunes and leave me a review. Check out the show notes with more information and links at www.susierosenstein.com. And while you're on my website, if you haven't done so yet, make sure to grab your copy of my free ebook, 10 Simple Ways to Bust Out of Your Midlife Funk. Just go to www.susierosenstein.com forward slash midlife funk. This will totally get you going too. I promise. Let's do this, ladies, one interesting opportunity at a time. Thanks so much for listening. <music>